Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to COVID-19, Your Questions Answered. This is part of a webinar series addressing the most pressing questions from this unprecedented uh, coronavirus pandemic. My name is Bill Worrell. I'm a director at First Service Residential, and I will be moderating today's conversation. Joining us today are Donna DiMaggio Berger. Donna is a shareholder at Becker Law Firm, specially, specializing in community association law. We also have uh, Anthony Gragnano. Anthony is a regional director at First Service Residential. Anthony and Donna, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. So as North America's property management leader and uh, at First Service Residential, and with Becker as a leading a law firm in association law, uh, we are all very closely connected to the coronavirus outbreak, as you may imagine. Uh, deemed essential services, we are on the front lines every single day. We share valuable insights, insights navigating this uncharted territory. In our comprehensive 90-minute webinar entitled, navigating the coronavirus in your community. And in the weeks since, we've received hundreds of questions and emails from community association board members and property management professionals alike on a variety of different topics from access control to cleaning protocols, amenity usage, legal and financial considerations to name a few. And so therefore, we are now tackling these topics individually, we're diving deeper, we're sharing best practices, we're offering guidance as we move through this pandemic and as the pandemic continues to evolve, certainly on a daily basis. Uh, this session and subsequent sessions are really intended to offer uh, and, and be used as a guide, as I said, and to share those best practices. But of course, we're all very, very sensitive that each, each of our states that are on the call, being Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee, and then inside of each of those states, every county, every community association is very, very unique and has specific situations. And so therefore, please, we hope you take away some, some good thoughts and best practices for your community as they are applicable. As always, we encourage you to review this, this information with your association attorney before you actually implement or adopt uh, new rules or protocols in your community. Next slide. So we'll jump right on into the questions. So the first question, which we, this is, we received a lot of these and, and it's continuing to evolve over the weekend. Uh, so what accommodations should we make if a resident is site isolated or self quarantined or has confirmed to have contracted the virus? Donna, will you kick us off here? Sure. I mean, I think it's a great question, and it's one that a lot of our associations are grappling with right now, Bill, as more and more infections and quarantine situations come to light. And there's two perspectives here. There's the practical uh, answer to the question you just posed, and then there's the legalities associated with taking on additional uh, duties when it comes to people and a household that is quarantined. So let's talk about the practicalities first. Certainly it makes sense, and I'm sure Anthony's gonna talk at length about what First Service is doing to help those households. Certainly from a practical standpoint, it makes sense to help people who are in a quarantine household in terms of trash disposal, retrieving mail, um, deliveries, because they're certainly gonna be housebound. So that absolutely makes sense for management to set up those protocols. Also, by doing so, you encourage people, other people who may also be infected, to come forward and let management and the board know that they have a situation and they need help. Now, from a legal standpoint, the question is, what accommodation should we make if a resident self-isolated or self-quarantined? The reality is, there is not typically a duty on the board's part to acquire these different obligations in terms of removing trash for a particular unit. Uh, delivering, uh, uh, making deliveries directly to the door of that unit. So you need to talk to legal counsel. Number one, I would urge associations to speak to counsel and have them look at your documents. In some sets of documents I've seen over the years, there actually is an affirmative duty on the part of the boards 
to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the residents. If you have that language in your documents, it may be a different analysis than if you don't. You also have to think about the type of community you're in. If you're in a community with a particular vulnerable demographic, um, part of the association's due care might be to acquire those obligations and to help those owners. But I would also say lastly, that you want to make sure that the steps you're taking to help those people in quarantine do not land you in the category of no good deed going unpunished. And you know what that means in that you may be removing trash and then the resident later tells you that you've thrown out a $30,000 Rolex in the trash. So one of the things you can do to approach that and perhaps better insulate the association and the management company is to speak to counsel and see if you should be getting an indemnification or a release from the quarantined household. Absolutely. And Donna, just to piggyback on some of that from the practical things that we're doing out in the field right now, um, definitely it, it's about how do you accommodate? It's that customer service side while still staying within the boundaries that Donna was just speaking about. Um, so one, obviously you have the trash removal, which, which is normal, common. Um, and then you start to talk about, you know, many people have dogs. Well, are they to leave their apartment and go walk their dog? Um, what we've done in some of the buildings has been to help coordinate dog walkers. Um, so it's not so much that we want our team out there walking the physical dog, but being able to coordinate all those different things. As well as then the other major thing is how we have these people traveling through the building. So another big thing that we've been working with, the people that are self-quarantining or self-isolating, have been the ability to have them call down to the front desk and say, hey, I have a doctor's appointment or I'm leaving the building at such and such a time. And we've actually been able to coordinate the usage of the elevators so that they don't have to interact with multiple or be afraid to interact with multiple people. And then when they come back home, you know, and once they leave, we sanitize the elevator since we know that there is some type of concern. And then they actually call when they come back home hey, I'll be back home in about 10, 15 minutes, and our team prepares for their arrival so that we actually help uh, get them through the building with as limited interaction as possible. And I think two high-level uh, items that we're thinking about here, one of our promises as a management company, core promises, is to mitigate risk. And here what we're trying to do is certainly mitigate risk for the association, but also mitigate risk for all of the residents in any given community. So Anthony, you mentioned on the, in, in a high rise setting, uh, sanitizing common areas, the, the, the travel path, for example, but in our garden style communities and HOAs, for example, if you have a tele-entry system at the guard gate, if you have different types of access controls, let's not assume people are wearing gloves as they're coming in and out of the community, right? So just because you live in a single family home, doesn't mean that, that, that you might be, you know, not exposed in different ways as well. Exactly. And, and it's really just thinking about what that path of travel looks like for that individual from their day to day, you know, when they do have to leave a unit for a reason, what does that path look like and how do we limit either help interact or help, uh, help that individual uh, with their self quarantine and then obviously also protect the uh, common areas. And Bill, I, I would only add to that, this is where communication becomes so crucial because mm. you don't want your residents believing that there's a certain level of cleaning like every five minutes that's taking place. Their expectations need to be reasonable and this really is a two-way street. We don't want residents thinking that they can abdicate all personal responsibility for their own health to the board or to professional management. There is certainly an obligation on the part of the owners to also mitigate their own risks. And that included in that obligation is adhering to the association's COVID-19 protocols, wearing face coverings when they are leaving their unit perhaps, and in the elevators, uh, adhering to social distancing. If there's communities with shared laundry facilities, it may be wiping down those facilities before they put their, before they put their items in the machines, wiping down all surfaces, running a bleach cycle. So there is, this really is a two-way street in terms of safeguarding the health and, and safety of the residents. And the residents play a key role in that. So that's where communications become key because sometimes we need to remind residents that there are steps that they need to take as well. Absolutely. It's a great point. And then when you're writing the, the communications, right, I've always found it to be 
um, critical that we approach it professionally, but then also with empathy. So it's not the stereotypical, if you will, community association who's just passing rules and, and, and they're, they're beat cops out there trying to enforce these things. This is genuinely caring about uh, the health of the community so that we can get things back open. So this next question is very tough. Uh, we've been dealing with a lot of this uh, and sharing best practices with our, with, our, with our partners in New York and Chicago and, and uh, different areas where there are hotbeds. So we have a lot of residents here in the Southeast US who have second or third homes and they've, cho they've chosen to quarantine here or to ride this out here. And we've had a lot of residents as well who have not gone back home, uh, some, maybe some of the snowbirds. So when they come back to their home here in the Southeast, can we deny them access to their condo? And if not, can we ask these residents to quarantine in their unit per the governor's orders? This is tough, Donna. How do we deal with this on the front lines when folks are coming back to their home? Right. Well, to the first, uh, the first part of that question, I would say a vigorous no, that you cannot prevent people who own a unit from returning to their unit. And the governor's executive order contemplates these people coming back into the state. The governor's order didn't say these people are not welcome, we're shutting down our borders, we're not gonna let them in. So the order contemplates that there are gonna be people, and this is true in other states as well, I haven't seen any governor's orders that closes a border, even the borders between New York and New Jersey or Connecticut. So most of our associations, Bill, have incorporated the governors and the state and the local executive orders into their own particular COVID-19 protocols. And that's important, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. We can't prevent people who own property from coming back and accessing their property. So you have to let them in. I will tell you a funny story about quarantining. I got a call from a client a couple weeks ago and they said, we have some New Yorkers at the pool. I said, well, how do you know? They said, they're pasty. Uh, okay, not sure that's prima facie evidence that they came from New York or in the Northeast, but we'll, we'll roll with that. Um, in terms of what can we do to ask them to quarantine in their unit, the governor's already asked that. And as I said, so have many of the local orders and many of our associations have incorporated those executive orders into their own COVID-19 protocols. So if you know you've got people that are here from a hotspot and they should be quarantined, here's what you do. Number one, talk to them first, because sometimes that's all it takes in some cases is a, again, a gentle reminder at first, hey, we know you're supposed to be quarantining, please do this, it's for your safety, we're gonna help you, just as Anthony laid it out, we're gonna make it as painless as possible for you to adhere to the quarantine, but please do it. Now, if somebody says, I don't care what you say, I'm gonna continue to violate the quarantine, you've got two, two additional steps. And I would suggest getting on these paths simultaneously and seeing which one results in the quarantine order being complied with. Number one, pick up the phone and call the, the local Department of Health. Um, Florida has a real, and all the other states too, they have a real vested interest in making sure that people don't spread this virus, okay? Contact your local Department of Health, let them know you have somebody that you believe is violating quarantine. Department of Health, is supposed to contact local law enforcement. Local law enforcement has been tasked with carrying out the DOH's orders. But I also strongly recommend at the same time contacting your council. If ever what, there was a time for associations to take enforcement seriously when it comes to their protocols, this is the time. These violations are not trivial. They're not similar to parking in the wrong spot, they're not similar to having an overweight cat. These are serious violations and they need to be dealt with expeditiously. So to contact counsel, the courts have been closed to varying degrees, but I will tell you they are open to address these very violations. So counsel could go and get an emergency injunction to keep these people in the unit for the full 14 days. Good points. And Anthony, right? Document, document. What are you seeing uh, on site, you know, boots on the ground uh, dealing with residents? Yeah, I mean, that's been the largest challenge and it really goes back down to communication like we've talked about um, and really building our case, right? So when, when you talk to 
when I have to make, pick up the phone and call counsel or pick up the phone and talk to Donna, it's, well, what steps have we taken so far and what actions have we done? So making sure that we have that clear communication timeline, what that looks like. And then, yes, that first touch base with our residents that are coming back from New York. I've noticed most have been open about, hey, we're returning or we're coming back. Um, but then we do have our handful that, of course, you know, sneak in in the middle of the night and 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 then all of a sudden are show, showing up and, you know, the neighbors are really calling down and saying, hey, property manager, what do we do about this? And then that's where we're really wrapping in legal to be able to talk through it. Because um, each case is unique and then you have to make sure you're not um, selective enforcement or, or anything along those lines that you're doing a, a comprehensive look at each, uh, each resident. So... And it's Anthony, definitely been a challenge. In one of the communities we represent mutually, I believe we had a conversation about key fob activity. So yep. the key the key fob activity, that's great because that actually showed the people got in in the morning and about two days later they'd been on and off the elevators about six times. Right. Right. And so back to communication is key, right? So that everybody knows the steps that we're taking. Uh, we want to respect every homeowner. Uh, and we also want to respect the folks that are here full time who are concerned. And, and there's this fear out there, right? We're all watching the news every night. We see all these big, big numbers. So understanding that, being empathetic to every resident in every community. And by the way, we're not picking on New Yorkers, uh, New Jersey, and wherever they may come from, Canada, et cetera. So, uh, so thank My you hometown, for that. Chicago, even Chicagoans. There you go. Absolutely. Okay, next, uh, next slide, we touched on this. And another question, so we've been dealing with this on the front lines. Anthony, I'm gonna let you start it off, but if a resident does violate one of these published orders, uh, what legal responsibility do we have? And can the association be held liable? So maybe we start with the liability piece and then let's go back to Donna on the legal piece. How's that sound? Well, I think it's definitely been, uh challenging learning along the way over the past several weeks, but uh, between working with our insurance agents and obviously our councils, it, it really comes back to documentation, right? So one, the board should definitely not be authorizing usage of common areas if they've been governed by uh, a government entity to be shut down, right? So you may not have insurance coverage, you may not have um, DNO coverage because you are now willfully making an act against a governmental order. So, and it's tough right now because everyone's going stir crazy. And I have to say, you know, as we're doing this recording, we're probably uh, four, four or five weeks in now. Um, and, and it's really become more challenging as we are now at this point of stir craziness with, with a lot of the residents. So I, I, it's been a challenge. Um, and it's really been, we've been asking to just make sure we are documenting again, back down to that, you know, from the association side, being the board of directors and property management, it's about documenting what you're doing because then yes, if a resident decides to then violate not only your rule, um, now they're going against the, the governmental orders. And that's where unfortunately at this time we, you know, it's that true partnership with legal because my next phone call is to Donna saying, hey Donna, what do we do? And, and I'll tag team it off to Donna as a nice segue. And just to, just to Donna, before we bring you in on this one, to add on to what Anthony is discussing, documentation is critical as it relates to what are the new cleaning protocols? What have we done to cross train staff, for example, that may not be utilized in different amenities to help with the cleaning? What are the reporting protocols? So all of the documentation that we have to support the association to demonstrate we do have, we have taken care, we have done due diligence, and the association is moving forward in the right direction. So Donna, legally, what's your take on this? So in terms of liability, typically the association will not be liable for the actions of third persons, okay? So if a, if a resident is running around and violating quarantine, the association is not typically responsible for a third person violating a governmental order. Let's put that on the table first. However, the association does have a duty to mitigate foreseeable risks, a duty of due care. And there is a foreseeable risk associated with the transmission of COVID-19. So you know that if somebody is infected and they continue to walk through your hallways and in your elevator and in your common areas, 
Now, part of your due care obligation is to do something about it. With regard to the county and municipal orders, I'd like to tell clients this, that's the floor, not the ceiling. That is the minimum. As Anthony mentioned, certainly falling below that floor presents an arguable claim that you have recklessly endangered or not exercised due care. But associations have statutory and documentary authority to go beyond, to create a ceiling, so to speak. And there's been confusion with this bill in terms of what the, what the executive orders are saying and maybe perhaps a more stringent association protocol. And this is where, again, communicating with counsel is gonna be so important. And I see a, a wide disparity amongst boards. Some boards are not looking to get any tougher than what the, the local orders are saying for a variety of reasons. And look, it doesn't make you the most popular person to say, we're gonna be a little bit tougher because we have a vulnerable demographic in this building, okay? But we're a multi-family building with shared laundry facilities, and that puts our residents at greater risk. They can't spread out. This is not a single family homeowners association, or we're operating a 55 and over community. And really it's not 55 and over, it's probably 75 and over. So you have to take those, those, all of those factors into account. But in terms of the association being held liable, if somebody is violating quarantine, um, you're not acquiring that duty, but there is a foreseeable risk. And the association has to, if they have the ability to, if they have the ability to mitigate or minimize a foreseeable risk, they should. This is very similar to security. And there was a Florida Supreme Court case on security. There's been numerous cases on that. So speak with counsel. There's things you can and should be doing when you know people are violating the orders. And again, lastly, most of our associations have incorporated those owners into their own protocols. Good, and just a, one final comment on this, Donna. I think it's also incumbent upon us as management and to keep feeding the boards, uh, our bosses, uh, the information with regard to your local municipal orders and staying plugged in. When do they expire? What is the next step, exactly what they are? So you have your, your municipal orders, your county orders, your state orders, and then of course, federal level and CDC. And it's Same a lot to take on, stay on top of, Bill, is it not? We've got yes. 40 attorneys and we've got a, a little group that's on top of this and the amount of time they've put in going through all these orders because these orders have been revised. By the way, the COVID-19 protocols require a revision too. If you haven't touched them in a couple of weeks, I would suggest going back and looking at them, comparing them to what's being done in terms of the revised orders and seeing if you need to update your protocols. Excellent recommendation. Excellent, thank you. So the next one, so here we go, right? Especially this weekend, every single day, there's more and more talk, and I would even go as far to say as some controversy with regard to reopening common areas and amenities. Uh, this, again, is at the municipal level, but of course, we're discussing today what's happening and what best practices should we follow at the community level to reopen common areas and, and amenities. Um, I'll also add that, uh, you know, folks are starting to get a little impatient. Uh, they, they've been in their homes. They've been doing a great job. Um, we're, we're trying to bend that curve, if you will, and, and in some places, it's bending more than others. Uh, so folks are ready to get back to at least a little bit of freedom uh, and outside. So, so how do you recommend we navigate this process in the community? Uh, Donna, we'll start with you here. Any, any thoughts from your firm and, and some, of the, some of the conversations going on at Becker? The, the pressure is that boards are being put under to reopen is completely yeah. understandable. The situation in the Berger household is getting rather grim. That being, that being said, I'm going to give the same advice that professional coaches give to their athletes, which is when you're recovering from an injury and you think you're better, maybe you wait another week or two to make sure you're really better and you don't re-injure yourself. The last thing you want to do in an association is open up your common areas prematurely, only to have to close them again in a few weeks. That becomes a problem. I think we really have to take our cues from our, our government officials, who I see across the board seem to be exercising some restraint in this area. 
And again, this is gonna be a little different geographically depending on where you're located. If you're in a, in, in an, a, in a state right now where the numbers have, are on a downward trend for the last two weeks, you may be able to safely reopen certain of your, certain of your common areas. Again, speak with management, speak with council, because there's gonna be a difference here, Bill, in terms of the analysis. One part of the analysis is going to be the type of amenities you have. If you have an, a significant number of amenities, do you open, do you throw the doors open and open them all? Or do you, do you dip your toes into the pool, so to speak? Uh, do you open the, the fitness room before you open the pool? or vice versa. You know, there's a lot that comes into play. Again, if you're a particularly vulnerable community, you may want to wait a little longer, but I completely understand the pressure that boards are being put under. And I would say for all our board members listening in right now, you're the leaders in these communities. People are looking to you and for every person that's critiquing you uh, and threatening you because you haven't opened up things, I guarantee you there's other members of your community that are applauding you for using restraint and for safeguarding them until you know that the risks have really passed. And it is, you know, Donna, it's, I, I, was, I was just on the phone this morning with one of my managers talking about, you know, what does next steps look like? And, and I really started to challenge my boards to also start the conversation today. So even though you might be two weeks out, you might be three weeks out, um, we all know what's gonna happen. A government order is going to come out, just like all the other ones did, shutting things down. It's going to be a blink of an eye, and all of a sudden, it's going to be people can go to the pool. Um, and we know that 8 a.m. the next morning or midnight that night, people are going to start saying, well, when's our pool opening? So starting to have those conversations now, and what does the new normal look like for your individual association? Which this goes back to Donna's previous comment that we can always be a little bit more restrictive than what the governmental order is. So that's the baseline, right? So as we go through and talk about the reopening, we may talk about what are the occupancy limits or do you do reservations for your gym, you know, when you first start to open? Because not only do we have to deal with, obviously, now this new traffic flow back through the building, but how are we then maintaining the cleanliness of these areas as well? Because we don't want to give that false sense of security that oh, everything's back where, you know, based on your staffing, we need to make sure Right now, all of our focus has been the main traffic common areas, right? And we're doing a really good job of being able to keep those sanitized and, and updated and more frequently. Well, the moment we start to open up the pool or we open up the gym, that's just going to bring on, well, that means Susie, the housekeeper, or, or Fernando, the, the porter, might not be in those areas now, and they are now back to another duty. So it, it, it's going to be a challenge, but we've really started to start the conversation today because you need to put in a place what's going to work best. You know, I have one property that has two pools, you know, and I was talking to the board ju just over the weekend actually about, you know, when we do get into this, do we open both pools or do we open one pool? And really, you know, our first conversations were, well, the issue with only opening one pool is you're just going to drive more occupancy to the one pool. So, you know, it's the challenges of just really be able to take a step back. Don't get lost in the, in the chaos, but what is our, what is our baseline going to look like? What are we going to be doing? And that's really where we're going to talk about lower occupancy. We're going to talk about, you know, still social distancing, um, you know, condos that used to rent out their club rooms might still be restricted for a while. You know, why bring 50 outsiders into your community? Let's focus in on the actual association members. Let's get life back to normal there and then slowly expand as, as the time continues. I, I think those are great points, Anthony. I think you need to roll it back the way you implemented it. We did not implement a complete shutdown at first. If you recall a few weeks ago, we started implementing in steps. One was reservations at the fitness room. One, another one was spacing out the, the furniture at, on the pool deck, um, heightening sanitization. I think the rollback needs to go in the opposite direction. Rather than you know, throwing open the floodgates, I absolutely agree with you, Anthony, that we need to now go back to that interim step we took when all of this started, which is once again, spacing things out, enforcing social distancing. And by the way, the new normal may be these virtual meetings and online voting and other things all still make sense until we have a vaccine, which we're being told is about a year to 18 months away, may come sooner, hopefully, 
but the new normal may be embracing these kind of interim steps where we're still using all of our amenities and we're still functioning, but we're being a little bit smarter about it until we get the vaccine. Absolutely. And I think just to chime in, another small piece of the process here is that we do have other recommendations from the CDC with regard to masks and sanitizing when you're out in public today, if you go to the grocery store. So that could carry forward into utilization of the common areas when they're eventually and gradually, I think that's a great recommendation, reopened. So for the managers out there, we're still focusing on the supply chains. If do not get discouraged, don't think perhaps that in the next couple of weeks, this is all gonna be gone. And as Donna said, there's the scientific, the medical fact, right? That there's not gonna be a, uh, any type of treatment or cure uh, this year uh, to this virus probably. And so therefore get your orders in for your masks, your sanitizing, your cleaning information. You will get, you will receive them. Uh, we've been able to, 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 to purchase big amounts for our clients as well uh, to support them. And Bill, maybe the, when the executive, the state of emergency is lifted, maybe you don't throw open the association office to foot traffic. Maybe again, you keep it with the advanced reservations. You need your managers healthy. You need to safeguard your workers. And I know in the past, you know, it's been a revolving door in the associate, association office. You know, you've got people that love to come and hang out. Some even like to be nice. Others like to come and complain. But maybe you don't throw open the association office to foot traffic just so quickly. Maybe you wait a little bit. Absolutely. Very, very good. Uh, and I like that recommendation so that we can take, right, Anthony, we can take our protocols because this is very community specific. We can take our protocols as we've implemented uh, any restrictions and any orders provided by the government. And as Donna mentioned, let's just replay that in reverse yep. and, and reopen the, the same way we implemented. I think that might be a great recommendation. Okay, well, Donna, Anthony, thank you so much. That's all we have time for today. Uh, you guys were just wonderful, excellent, and really appreciate your support today. On the slide now, we have some additional resources. Um, every, every, uh, everybody will be able to view these resources and uh, also get a copy of this recording. So don't, don't think you have to write everything down uh, that quickly. And please uh, keep a, an eye out for additional information and in upcoming webinars. Uh, I think every, I, I wanna speak for everyone on the panel and thank you all uh, for your time and demonstrations today and your great advice. Thank you again, board members, for your leadership in your communities in these trying times. And uh, thank you to all of our clients, a sincere thank you who have allowed us to support and serve you and your residents through these times. Thank you again, be safe, be well. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill.